Great to see you all this morning. I'm very excited to, to, to be ministering uh, again today and uh, feel like I do have a word in season for you. Um, the, the, the word humility has uh, really been um, thrown up a lot at me over the last several weeks, and I um, really had to face like uh, the thought of what? What is humility, really? Uh, because the Bible says a lot about it. It's a theme that goes from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, and it's a major part of how God moves, of what, what God does, and um, He wants it humility to be a big part of His kids' lives. Because uh, it's who God is. God isn't just functioning in humility. He is the essence of what humility is. And so um, I want to uh, talk to you about the power of humility. And I think about God introducing Himself in the form of Jesus Christ to the whole world. He didn't come in grandiose uh, splendor. He didn't come in royal regalia. He could have come with myriads of angels, right? He could have come in the splendor of heaven in all his majesty and pitched up around the whole world at one time present everywhere, but chose not to do that. Chose to come how? Chose to come not in a royal household. He chose to come in poor, humble, broken, small, almost invisible. He came like that. And that's not a mistake. That isn't just uh, God being God. No, that's God doing something with intentionality because He's expressing his essence, who he is, what he values, what's important. Jesus comes and he's born to a, a, a woman who was betrothed, engaged. Think about all the issues around that. Jesus comes born into a place where there is no room for him. Not a, nothing, no one announcing, no one declaring. Jesus is born in a in a, in, a, in a really a rustic cave. It's not the Swiss Family Robinson style nativity scene that you think it is. It is actually a hollowed out cave with animals living in it. And Jesus doesn't have a bed to lie in. He's put in a feeding trough and he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. It sounds so cute. He was wrapped in rags. He was born to poor parents. He grew up in a cave city from Nazareth. If you ever go there and see it, there would have been historically maybe a hundred people in that little place. He had a humble trade of that of a carpenter. What does that say to us? about God. God values humility very, very highly. God doesn't just value uh, a humility. He's drawn like a magnet to humility. And like a powerful force, He resists the antithesis, which is pride. So I want to I have a look at this thing called humility. Because divine humility is not like the humility that man tries to put on like a jacket. You see, we all know humility is a good trait. It's a good characteristic, yeah? We even admire it when we see it sometimes displayed. But humility that is fleshly, humility that is Human is not real, true humility. 
Humility that comes from our ability is not true humility. Only humility that comes from divinity is true humility. It's like somebody who's singing a song, but they can't quite hit the note. They're close. You've ever heard that? They're just uh, slightly over uh, or slightly under, flat or sharp. That's humility when tried to be worn intentionally through behavior or through trying to develop just good character. Have you ever heard of a humble brag? You see it on social media all the time, especially from pastors or athletes. I'm so honored. It starts off like that. I'm so honored to, to just be a part of this great moment where I am now standing in the same room as this great person. And then they go on to talk about how wonderful they are and the, the platform that they're standing on and how awesome it is that uh, they get to do that. That's called a humble brag. Flesh cannot function in godly humility. It's impossible. It's impossible. We can only ever fake it. Have you ever tried to be humble? Come on now. Ever try to be humble? It's weird. When somebody's trying to be humble, you can tell they're trying to be humble. It's, this topic is a slippery fish. And I'm going to blow some holy cows out of the water. I'm going to shoot them in the head this morning if that's okay. All right. James chapter 4 verse 6, 7 and 10 reads, But he gives more grace. Say more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So this word grace here means, means divine favor or unmerited favor or divine ability. That concept of God's power and ability and God's favor toward you is wrapped up all in the one word grace here. And therefore, he says, God... Resist the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, because we've got the word therefore. Come on, everyone say therefore. When you have the word therefore, you have to go back. You have to go back and see what was said because something else is going to follow based on a root system that was just communicated earlier. So we go back, we we're talking about humility and how God loves humility and how God wants humility in the lives of His children, right? And, but in order to understand how to get there, you've got to read on. And it says this, it says, therefore, because God loves humility and He hates pride, submit to God, huge part of how to get humble, you cannot be humble unless you are submitted, yielded, dependent on God. That is the only way humility can naturally flow. Humility can't be forced. It must flow out of intimacy. Humility flows out of communion with Jesus. Listen to what it says. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So how do you get the devil to flee from you? Submit to God. You don't go chase the enemy to make him submit. You don't beat him with a stick. You don't argue with him. You don't, you know what I'm talking about now. Now we're casting demons out. We're breaking down strongholds in the heavenly realm. I remember hours and hours of prayer meetings and pacing up and down. And then uh, next thing we're uh, talking to the devil. Oh, devil, you got to get off Johannesburg. Uh, you got to get off that family. No, 
You're wasting your breath. The amount of prayers we prayed that were that... You pray to God, not to the devil. You submit to God, and as you submit to God, you automatically resist the devil. That's the only way to resist the devil is to submit to God. And out of that submission to God, listen now, it goes on and it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So this is how humility comes. Comes from submission or dependence or yieldedness to God. And it comes from intentionally drawing near. That word to draw near, it speaks of intimacy, closeness, relationship. And out of that, listen to what the rest of the scripture says. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will, what will he do? He's going to lift you. How many of you want God to lift you? God to lift you, not man to lift you, God to lift you up. You see, when God lifts up, man cannot put you down. Nothing can put you down when God lifts you up. So many of us are praying, God, lift me. God, lift my profile. God, lift my finances. God, lift my family. God, lift my marriage. God, lift. Lift me, right? But what God is saying is, I'm not going to lift you until there's humility. And what is humility? Humility is true dependence on God. To be completely dependent on God means that I'm saying no to my ability and yes to His ability. I'm saying no to what I can do so that I can say yes to what He can do. I'm not relying on myself, my education, my last name, my bank account. I'm not relying on my network, who I know and who I don't know. I am relying completely on the fact that Jesus loves me. I have a relationship with him. I am a child of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I'm relying on that communion, that intimacy, that yieldedness to God that enables me then to flow in humility. Some of people think humility is a lack of pride. No. Some people say, oh, look, you know, the guy, that great, arrogant person has, you know, fallen and now they are being humbled. They're not being humbled. They're being embarrassed. Big difference. Big difference. Embarrassment does not equal humility. Okay? Completely different. Embarrassment is something happened that revealed what was really going on. You were exposed and now you're ashamed. And because you're ashamed, it doesn't mean that you have now humbled. You're not. I, I'm not. Humility, divine humility comes out of intimacy. It's not something that's put on you. It's something that comes out of you. And if you want God to lift you, you have to understand humility. Humility is not a self-deprecating behavior. To be self-deprecating means that, oh, I'm not very good. I'm not very talented. You know, not, not good looking, not really that smart. You know, I just, I just really need God. And, you know, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm just broken and. You know what that is? You know what that is? That, that, that's more than annoying. You know what that is? Self-pity and you're dishonoring the fact that you are made in the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not, hum- it's not being humble. It's being disrespectful to God. So that's not humility. Hallelujah. So it says that, uh, let's carry on, let's carry on. Matthew 23, 11 says, But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself 
will be exalted. So there's a divine law here. You can't escape this. This, this, is, this is just how God has made this thing like gravity. You know, what goes up? Okay. What a man sows? Okay, so there's a divine law we're seeing here. You exalt yourself. You promote yourself. You rely on yourself. You push yourself forward. You enable yourself. You take matters into your hands. You do it your way. God's saying, I'm going to allow you to come into a season where I'm going to, again, teach you how to be humble. Not the humbling of this world. God does not embarrass his kids to make them humble. Okay? So just get it out of your mind. That is not what God does. He does not function that way. God is a God of love. I never embarrass my children in order to get them to change their behavior. To embarrass somebody publicly is not an act of love. It's not an act of love. It's shaming them. And so when it comes to how God deals with us, he's saying that uh, once you are exalted and puffed up, because I love you so much, I'm going to bring you to the end of yourself. That's why the Lord says, without me, you can do. And he's going to bring you to the end of yourself, not so that he can teach you a lesson. No, so that you learn to become dependent on God again, so that humility can flow out of you. Big difference. God's not punishing you with, you know, we always quote the scripture. Oh, you know, be careful of pride because if you don't, you're going to fall. No, we need to be very careful that we don't see humility as a punishment. Humility is not a punishment. Humility is part of God's divinity. It's part of his nature. It's part of his beauty. And when God gets us to function in true humility, you'll be amazed at what that life looks like. That's not what you think it looks like. It's not a lack of confidence. It's not poverty. It's not undermining who you are and what you're called to do. It's not dumbing down success. How can, you, how can you give a testimony and still be humble then? How can you say, hey, if it wasn't for God, my friend, that deal would never have gone through. That 200 million rand deal that we were working on would never have taken place to God be the glory for that. Uh, is that a humble brag? No, that's honoring God, being confident in what he's done, recognizing my dependence on him and giving him all the praise. Amen. So Matthew 18 says this. This is a beautiful scripture because now Jesus starts to describe what humility really is. He starts to actually show us this is what divine humility looks like. These are the traits of the divinely humble. These are the traits of those that are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We're not talking about the kingdom of earth. We're talking about when you get into heaven, that there will be a level of greatness prescribed to a certain group of individuals who have these kinds of traits that have been birthed in them through intimacy with the finished work of Christ. Now watch this. This is absolutely amazing. Only Jesus can do. He, it's the upside down kingdom of God. He turns this concept of what humility is completely on its head. Greatness is not the antithesis of, hum, of humility. Watch this. Matthew 18 verse 1 says, And at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, whoever humbles 
himself what? He has a very important word. Come on, say as. as. That's right. Otherwise, you're going to miss it again. All right? Whoever humbles himself as a, this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about something very important. God's saying, this is greatness in my eyes. This is true greatness. How many of you want to live a great life? You want to leave a mark. You want to, you want to, you want to carry that greatness into eternity. Then listen up. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Jesus is saying, I value what I'm saying right now so much that I want you to know that I identify myself and who I am with the example I've just given you over being like a child in order to see humility flow. So let's have a look at some of the traits that reveal the kind of humility God wants us to have. Childlike traits. I've got about seven here. There's not a comprehensive list, but I think that you will agree with me, especially you moms and dads, if you hang around little children. It's not talking about an older child. We're talking about a child probably from four years on down. This way, right? Okay. I'm learning. I'm Elena. Seven childlike traits that reveal the kind of humility God wants to birth in us and flow out of us. Okay? When I think about a little child, one of the top traits that I really think they display very, very powerfully is that of being dependent. When you've got a little kid, uh, which we got lots there in the, in the beautiful little preschool that Jesus has blessed us with. I, I'll go into the preschool and um, I'll look at how much these children can't do anything for themselves. Can't tie their shoelace. They can't open the gate. They can't operate a cell phone. Some of them are dangerous, <laughs> calling the United States. <laughs> Hello. They can't do a lot of stuff. They are very dependent on adults to help them do what needs to be done. They can't make a meal and feed themselves. They can't change their own nappy. They can't bath themselves. There's so much that they rely on adults for. However, you'll never hear a little child apologizing for their dependency. Oh, I wish I, you know what? I'm just a child. I'm just, I can't tie my shoelaces. No, they just say, tie my shoelace. <laughs> right? They're dependent and they love it. They don't come, I can't make my food. They're like, where's my food? Because they're dependent. And they make no apologies. They actually celebrate their dependency on adults. And the adults sometimes celebrate the fact that their child's dependent. However, God is not like us in that He is the perfect Heavenly Father and He wants His children forever more and more and more and more dependent on His ability. He set it up that way. You will never get independent of your Heavenly Father. He wants kids so dependent. And that's why Jesus uses this example of little children because a little child really displays the kind of humility that God is attracted to. That kind of humility. Not the kind of humility that comes from, oh, better sort my behavior out. I need to act more humble. No, there's a humility that is of this world. And then there's a humility that comes from intimacy with Christ. That first place is dependence. I need you. 
I've got to have you, Jesus. I need your help, Lord. Oh, I can't live without you, Lord. I can't tie my shoelace without you, Lord. I need you to help me. I need you to help provide this meal. I need you to help me on every side. Every decision. God, I need you. This requires humility, doesn't it? Because you're saying, you're standing up in the face of something the world celebrates. And what the world celebrates is independence. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. My success is because I worked so hard. Oh, I tell you what, those degrees on the wall didn't create themselves. Now all those letters after my name, that's because I studied like a dog. And I have a lot of student debt and I'm 55. I'm not dissing on education. Maybe I am. Compared to dependency on God. Okay? God can make up for a lot. I'm not saying He's not going to call you to get educated and go and do what you got to do. Yes, He will. But that isn't to substitute dependency on God. God wants you dependent. And that requires humility to say, without you, Lord, I can do nothing. And I really believe that. Another thing I've noticed about little children is how trusting they are. Trusting. I don't go into the school a lot, but the kids have seen me around there enough to have recognized me. Now I go into the school. People tell me I'm an intimidating looking guy, that I look like a Harley Davidson guy and they should imagine I've got an eagle tattoo on my back. I don't. Hallelujah. I've got something. No, just kidding. Uh, but these kids are so trusting. I walk into the school now and they're like, ah, come in. They're hanging on my leg. And I just realize how much trust there is there with these kids. I think about my own children. When they were really little, we would sometimes go to a, a park or whatever and um, I remember one day, Christian just decides to dive into my arms. He, there's no nego- he doesn't know whether I'm strong enough to catch him. He couldn't think about that at all. He didn't know whether I, I had a good uh, hand-eye coordination. Didn't know that at all. Uh, he didn't even know if I had the muscular ability to take care of whatever he was going to do. But he would just jump off the jungle gym into my arms. So much trust. To the point that when we're not even playing that game and I'm just walking past, suddenly a kid's flying through the air at me and I'm like, whoa! (laughs) Now, that's how much trust is there. That he thinks I can do anything. Whether I'm aware or not aware. It's my dad, I'm going. And that's how God wants us to be with Him. That no matter what, no matter what you're going through, you know God's got you. God's got you. God has got you. He's got you. It doesn't matter. You go flying off. Woohoo! That childlikeness of total trust in who He is and what He can do. That's humility. That's humility. That's the kind of humility God is, he's just drawn to like a magnet. He cannot resist it. He's like, oh, I like it when you do that. I like it when you do that. When you just jump. Another thing I know about little ones is that they're simple. I didn't say stupid. I said simple. Simple. Everything's simple. Everything's simple. Have you seen a, a, a kid when they're really sleeping? They just had a simple day. They played their heart out. They ate their heart out. They did whatever they were going to do. And now it's time to rest. And they sleep hard. You know, you can rock and come, wake up, wake up. It's a simple life. It's uncomplicated. It's uncluttered. They're not worried about anything. It's simple. When I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm tired, I'll sleep. You know what I'm saying? That's the way kids are. 
I don't worry about a thing. Do you know what the Bible says concerning simplicity? That we're not to lose the simplicity that there is in Christ. Not to overcomplicate it. Not to do mind-bending gymnastics in order to believe certain strange stuff. God wants it to be simple. Simple. Do you know that as adults, nothing ever leans toward simplicity. Everything moves toward more and more complexity. Complexity of relationships and dynamics. Complexity of management of finances. Complexity of problem solving. Complexity because the house and the car and the thing that you bought, now the car's broken and the roof leaks. Complexity. The more you have, the more complex it gets. And so God's saying, hey, you know what? I want you to come back to the simplicity that there is in Christ. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. I formed you in your mother's womb. And you know what? I can take care of you. If God knows about the sparrows when they fall, even one, how much more valuable are you than many sparrows? This is humility. Humility. I am describing divine humility. This humility does not look like the humility that is produced by the flesh. No, no, no. no. This is another level. Another thing I know about kids and their aspect of divine humility would be that of honesty. They're brutal. Walked into the playground. He looked at me and said, Why are you so fat? Because I like food. You know, where's his hair, mommy? Where's his hair? No apologies. They don't apologize for their honesty. They're not scared to tell you, no, but I'm only three. I can't do that. They don't have a problem telling you they can't do something. They're not embarrassed or ashamed. I'm only little. I'm just little. You're big and bald. Isn't that amazing that kids are that honest? And that's how God wants us to be with Him. Honest. Say, stop trying to cover up your weakness. Stop trying to act like it's all good when it's not. Stop trying to. Put the mask on with God. He can see straight through it all anyway. Not for His sake, for your sake. God says, be honest with me. So that I can meet you at your point of honesty. And I can fix what needs to be fixed. And you're going to recognize I fixed it because you saw that it was broken. Wow. Honest. Kids are so forgiving. They are so forgiving. I mean, it's it, tragic what you hear little, little children can sometimes go through. Parent puts a cigarette out on a baby. You know, a child is locked up in the closet and for four hours in the dark, deprived of food. But then you see the child come out, little child, and the mom feels bad. She says, I shouldn't have done that. I feel bad. It's okay, mommy. I love you. What's that? That's infinite forgiveness ability in the heart of a little child. What does that say? It says that God wants us to know how much we are loved and have been forgiven. And then the scripture says, as you have been forgiven, so also forgive those who sin against you. Not even sin. The word there is trespass. Come on, how many were in, in, in school and you did, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. You, you, you can kind of spit it out fast, right? And it's hard to sometimes and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against. Trespass is intentionally doing something wrong. It's malicious behavior. When someone is intentionally trying to hurt you, 
That's the level he's saying. The same way I do things wrong and I know they're wrong and I know that they're sinful, but you still forgive me, I need to also do that with everyone else. And God's saying, if you get intimate with you, I will give you my capacity for forgiveness. And that requires, again, not just requires, that is the greatest demonstration of humility. That childlike trait of infinite forgiveness is what real humility looks like. Because Jesus, Jesus doesn't leave this to our imagination. He talks about humility, and then he speaks about the example of it, and he says, it's a little child. These are the great ones in the kingdom of heaven. Another thing I've seen with children is how loving they are. Huge amount of love in their heart. Huge. You know, when your kids are little, especially if you have boys, when they're little, they don't care what anyone else thinks about their loving their parents. Right? They're not embarrassed like when they get when they're teenagers. Come on, give daddy a kiss. No, man. <laughs> Do you love me? Don't ask me here. My friends are here. Tell me you love me. You know, just to torture them over the phone. Do you love your dad? You know I do. I want you to say it. Tell, tell me you love me. No, dad, I'll tell you when I get home. No, 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 no. I know who's there. If you really love me, you're not going to be embarrassed. You're just gonna... You know how it goes when you get older. That is embarrassing stuff, man. When you are little, it's mommy. It's daddy. It's not mom, dad, hey, old bully, old queen. You know what I'm talking about? It's not, we don't refer like that when we're little. It's endearment. It's dependence. It's intimate. It's precious. It's naive love. It's, and this is, I can, I can show you the heart of God in the scripture where it says, and the spirit that God has given us cries out, Abba, Father. That word Abba means daddy. It's not just father, strict ruler of the household. No, it's daddy. It's I'm intimate with my father and he's daddy to me. That's crawl on the lap, daddy. And this capacity that you see in a child's heart for love. Like Gracie, she'll follow me around at home. Try not to embarrass her. She just loves me. Love. I'm telling you maybe 10, 15 times a day, she will say, I love you. 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 And I know how precious that is. Not that because I need to be affirmed of her love. I know she loves me. But she needs to say it. She needs to get it out. Because it strengthens our relationship every time she says that. And that's why I just have to say, even if I'm busy and want to do something else, and I could tell she's hanging around, she wants to give me a hug or just tell me she loves me, I'm going to stop everything. I love you. I love you too. That's how God wants it to be with you and Him. Because that is true humility. And lastly, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are probably the top seven, eight things. Would be that of their ability to believe. Their ability to believe and be teachable. You see, you can't be teachable if you don't believe what someone's telling you. Have you ever tried to teach somebody something and or their cup is already full? Have you ever tried to have a conversation with someone and all they are thinking about is what they're going to say back? Or up your story? It's not nice. Because you, it's, you can tell that what you're doing and saying has no value to them. There's nothing that you can do. Children believe. I remember once, I was probably five years old, walking back from school, there was a tuck shop, and it had burned to the ground. It was a wonderful day, because there were sweets there that were all exposed, 
and it was, I thought, this is my chance. And me and my mates ran into this burned down tuck shop and grabbed as many sweets as we could because it was now, like, who's going to want these burnt sweets, you know? So I ran in there and I got as many sweets as I could. But a little bonance to me, someone saw me doing that. And uh, I, the phone rang and my parents were at work and I was sitting uh, in the house and we were eating all of our loot. It was fantastic. We were just gorging ourselves on charred candy. And a uh, woman says, I saw what you did. You little thief. <laughs> she says, I want you to know that you and all your friends are now going to die because you are poisoned by this burnt, burnt sweets. <laughs> so, <laughs> really? Yes, really. Ding. She puts the phone on. I am bawling my eyes out. My friends are bawling their eyes out. We go and put a sit around the pool on the edge of the pool with our feet dangling. It's about 10 of us. And we're just crying. And then we can't cry anymore. And we're like, why are we crying? Do you feel sick? No, I feel good. <laughs> Realized we'd been duped by the owner of the sweet shop. But what I'm trying to say is we fully believed. I thought I was, go I was waiting to die. My friends were waiting to die. We were all sympathetic towards each other. But I haven't lived yet. I'm only five. But kids believe. And that's what God wants us to do is to just believe. Not because we have all the facts. Not because it all makes sense. Not because we worked it all out. Not because it fits in a box. Not because it all just is logical. No, He just says, Believe. Even Jesus says, if you don't believe in me, just at least believe in the miracles that I've done. If only you could just believe. That is what humility is, is to believe like a child. Come on, church. When that kind of humility is displayed before the Lord, it is irresistible. It's like a magnet that just sucks in His favor, sucks in His ability. And He says, I can't but help it. I am lifting you up. I'm lifting you up. Not because you deserved it, but because God loves humility. Not any humility, childlike humility. Come on, I think we just turned humility on its head this morning, right? Not something you wear. It's not something you wear. It comes out of you because of who you're connected to. Come on, let humility flow that He may lift you up in Jesus' name. Come and stand to our feet like little children that believe, little children. Oh, that are dependent, simple, honest, forgiving, loving, believing, trusting. Come on, put your hands into, into the heavenlies right now. Lift your arms, your hands up right now. We're going to pray into this. Say this with me, Jesus, like a little child, I come to You. And God, I thank You that You come to me. Thank You, Jesus, for making it simple again for making me fall in love with you again, for helping me just to believe again, to come back to the simplicity in Christ again. Oh, Jesus, to be humble like you. Childlike faith. Grow me like a little child. Mature me like a little child in Jesus.